are the Org. Our mission is to assimilate Star Trek The Next Generation, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, and beer. Lots of beer. Hello, friends. Hello. Welcome to Broadcast 8.2, and it's back Deep Space Nine this time round. After a little while now. Last time on Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, well, we had some feedback on our Generation special last time. Uh, Ravine and Fat Bones have been discussing the dodgy science around the nuclear inhibitor on the forum. Is the... that the thing that doesn't do anything like what they said it did in the movie? Yes. Oh, okay. Basically. So do check that out if you're in into a in a sciencey mood. Uh, we also heard from Brian Leggett. Leggett Brian. Indeed. Dear Orgs, I apologise for my prolonged absence. Any rumours indicating the Obsidian Order was responsible are definitely untrue. Mm, strokey chin, <laughs> strokey chin. Suffice to say, I've now caught up, and I'm sorry I missed both the festive season and Borecast 100. Only a couple of bits of overdue feedback for you. Firstly, going way back to the battle and getting really anal about spaceships, not the Constellation class, which I love, by the way, Anne-Marie asked if we ever actually get to see a tug ship. Euphemism. Oh, nice. <laughs> yes, we will get to see one a bit later on in Deep Space Nine briefly, though the scene gets reused at least once, if not more. However, since it looks like something my three-year-old son made out of Lego, it's nothing to get excited about. Ah, uh, okay. All the episodes involving Kardashians were good, naturally. There is nothing wrong with the justice system. It's eminently sensible. <laughs> you would say that. And generations. Turds. Yep. Big steaming turds. Yep. And sorry, Amory, but I do confess to being one of the other two people who th- would be happy to get anal about ready rules. Oh, fucking hell. But I won't encourage Peter if it means the world's first case of murder by anal beads. <laughs> I did get a bit angry. Yes, and indeed drunk. Anyway. Yeah, I needed to. <laughs> keep up the good work. I'm off to get some proper feedback written. I am, as always, your obedient servant on the other side of the DMZ, Leggett Brian. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yes, I, I'm, I'm pushing for a Ready Rooms mini sode on Space Doc Jury, but uh, I'm, I'm meeting considerable resistance at the moment. Yes. <laughs> Before we move on to tonight's episode, just a shout out to Damien the Argyle Smurf, who is in the midst of a moving house at the moment. Hope all goes smoothly, sir. Yeah, hope it's all cool. Stressful time, I know. Yep. But let's have a look at what the House of Quark has to offer. A freak accident becomes Quark's golden opportunity. His knife is at my throat. I plunge it into his chest. For when the soldier's family vows revenge, you killed my brother. Quark must marry the widow. It is done. What's done? Is it a wedding worth dying for? Ready. Next time on Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And as a bloody spoilery trailer, yes, it I was didn't rubber. remember this episode. I'm so bloody glad I didn't watch the trailer until after it. It does spoil the fact that he gets married, doesn't it? Which is a nice reveal in the the story, but hmm. well, it doesn't just that. You know, he appears on Kronos, which you're not going to know. You know, that's cool. Uh, well, no I think you could you could argue that, that that's a little bit of a teaser. Oh, we're going to get to see Kronos again. That would you know want, make people want to watch the episode without really giving the plot away, particularly. But yeah, but the, the fact that he gets it, married and is it yeah. to the death and uh, no yeah, yeah. crap spoilery trailer of shite, no like. <laughs> so you open with Quark and Rom in what at first instance anyway appears to be an empty bar, and you see Morn leaving with a date. He's in there. <laughs> <laughs> And Quark says, quotes, rule of acquisition 286, when Morn leaves, it's all over. And Rom's like, but there isn't a rule of acquisition 286. <laughs> yeah. And basically, there are fewer on people on the station because of fear of the Dominion, so trade is at an all-time low for Quark. But then you see that the bar isn't quite empty. There's a very, very, very drunk Klingon in the corner. It's Kojak. No, Kojak. Actually, <laughs> oh, yes, but, no, Kojak. Is that Ko- the tune? <laughs> yes, it could be, couldn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Shame he wasn't sucking lollipops in the bar. <laughs> no, we need a gif of, of he was sucking lollipops. There's no need to do Teddy Savalis as a Klingon, actually. Oh, He'd yes. look really impressive, wouldn't he? He would. He would. <laughs> He's got the right head shape and everything. Anyway, Kojak Sorry. in this is played by John Lendale Bennett, 
who will return as another Klingon in Apocalypse Rising. You said you thought look, yes, you, you look familiar. That's why. Okay. <laughs> he was a background extra in Icarus Factor, so as another Klingon, and he'll be the picture of Gabriel Bell in Past Tense. Will make sense a bit later on in the season. He was also a stunt double for Avery Brooks in several episodes. Okay. Uh, he was in Space Above and Beyond, which. Uh, it's been so long since I've seen it, I can't remember if he was a major character or not. And sadly died of a heart attack in 2006 oh, no. at the age of 54. Gosh, mm. that's no age. No. Anyway, Kojak, and he's going to be called that, is asking for credit. And Norm's like, oh, he's asking for credit. And Quark's like, let's see how this done. And then he stands up and goes, rah! And Quark's like, rah! And there's a fight, but he's really, really very, very drunk. <laughs> um, and falls on his own knife. Yep kills himself and quark is shocked and our son went he killed a customer (laughs) quite like as a response end teaser yep that's a good teaser yes so when we come back bashir is examining the dead klingon odo asks what happened yes odo's had a change of mask by the way now i did think he looked a bit different yeah the nose is the the most obvious difference it's an all-in-one mask now, rather than being several pieces applied. Okay. And it'll stay this way, I think, to the end of the, sh- the series. I mean, it doesn't matter, because he's a shapeshifter, so he can change his face as much as he wants yeah. to. So He's got a little bit better at faces, though. Yeah, well, arguably. Although I think he actually looks slightly more alien in this than he has done in the okay. past. But there we are. So I know asked what happened, and Rom is like... There'd been a conversation between Quark and Rom where Quark is like, this is an opportunity, look at all these customers, we're going to big this up, and I killed him in self-defence. And Rom's like, oh, but what if such and such, you know, what if the family comes looking for him? He's like, well, then we'll tell the truth, and until then, that's what we're doing, and I'll take your wages away. So Odo says what happened, and Rom goes, Quark killed him in self-defence, and then you get this really good yarn that I like, that he tells about the fight and everything, but Odo and Bashir are not impressed, Mm -hmm. and clearly don't believe it. Mm Mm-hmm. I love the way that Quark plays up to the crowd, though. Oh, he does. He's he's, oh, he's brilliant. He's a great storyteller. And then, hooray, it's Keiko. <laughs> and she's trimming her bush for now. <laughs> it's funny, I know my head didn't go to that place. <laughs> Keiko trims her bush. <laughs> I don't think we'll have that as an episode title. Oh, yes, please. I bet oh. iTunes will allow it. There's no swear words in there. <laughs> Well, we could argue that's literally what you see happening and there's nothing... Exactly. Keiko trims her bush. Sold. (laughs) Okay. Anyway, the reason she's trimming her bush, rather than doing anything more productive, is that she's clothed the school, as there's no Bajoran students anymore, and she can just tutor Jake and Nog. It's not worth having a school. She says she's fine, but she's really grumpy. I figure that's probably normal for her. (laughs) Oh, she just you know, sensibly points out that you know people aren't going to be wanting to bring their families on the station anymore because, no. well, who would into a effectively what's a war zone now? Yeah. So, and I like the fact that Dominion threat is having a knock on to every aspect of the station. So that's quite yeah. cool. So then you've got Odo and Quark, and he says that Kozak, except we're saying Kojak is the name of the dead Klingon. He was head of a powerful Klingon family, and you know it's Odo trying to get Quark to admit the truth, but it doesn't work. And what happens is Quark turns around to Rom and says it isn't about profit anymore. It's actually about respect. Respect? Respect. <laughs> Give me my respect. It's a trap. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, sorry, I've had a few beers. You become a Monkomari after a few pints. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Well, I always have been a bit fishy. Um, <laughs> let's move on. Yeah, don't, let's not go back to Keiko in a bush. Yeah. And, uh, it's a crack. Sorry. <laughs> Ooh, we, we've hit a low point already. That's Sorry. not good. He says he's striking a, a blow for Ferengi everywhere. And I like this because actually you've had the seeds of Quark being fed up about how other people view his race. They were in that episode, I think it was called the Gemma Dahl, wasn't mm-hmm. it? So it's, it's in character that yeah, he's yeah. taking this response. And then, as he's walking down a corridor, Quark is apprehended by uh, Dugar, who says he's Kozak's brother and wants to know if his brother died of honour. Yeah, and he'll turn up as another Klingon later down the line as well in Shattered Mirror. Okay. Yeah. He was also apparently one of the guys on the bus in Speed. So this is a second episode in a row we've had somebody from Speed. Okay. It's a bit weird. <laughs> and I've been fucking earwormed by the wheels on the bus. I've got to have a better <laughs> fucking tune yeah, cause than that. Yeah, because that was in the soundtrack of Speed, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh. My brain just went, the wheels and the bus go round and round. Oh, I'm the mental. Bomb on the bus goes. Anyway, carry oh, on. <laughs> don't. Tick, tick, tick. Mm-hmm. Tick, tick. Oh, ah, I need a new tune. Anyway, 
And you get this lovely scene with this sort of kabra. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which I like. And then Keiko and Miles have a romantic dinner. He's made a can of peas. Very popular <laughs> can of peas. <laughs> can of peas, yeah. Although he's serving up noodles and dumplings. It looks like all proper Japanese stuff. Right. Is that what can of peas looks like? See, I never saw any of them. <laughs> I don't know what canapes are. So. Right, canapes is, I don't know what it's actually French for, but it's basically little things. Now, the best canapes are when you go somewhere and they've got tiny mini pizzas. <laughs> They're really nice. But most of them are a bit shit, mostly pastry and possibly a bit of prawn. Oh. It's nice to see Miles and Keiko getting on for a change, though, isn't it? Yes. Because, like, every episode, generally, they're at each other's throats. But this one, actually, he, you know, he's being romantic and she's been quite sweet. And yeah. And actually see why they, they work. <laughs> yeah. And then you cut to Quark counting latinum. And uh, Kojak's widow, Grilka, appears. Yeah, played by Mary Kay Adams. <laughs> Now, I know that name. Uh-huh, yes, you do. Why do I know that name? And I recognised her and all. Oh, excellent, good, good. She's not one of Lurs from Bator, is no, she? No, no, she's not. So where do I recognise her from then? Babylon I... 5, under rather different makeup. The Toff. Not Toff. Not Toff. Not Toff. Not Toff. Yes, they replaced the the Toff actress for season two, was it? But that didn't work out very well, so they kind of dropped the character out. But she's a lot she's better in this than she is in Babylon 5, it has to be said. Yeah, so it's not tough. Like, I know yeah. I recognised her, and I guess I felt I recognised her as an alien, because I don't know what her face looks like, like, normally, if you see what I mean. Yeah, nor do I. <laughs> OK, I know I knew her, though. She's a cool character. Mm, she is, very strong. Yeah. But with a nice mixture of comedy and dignity as well. Yeah, and uh, she goes to attack Quark, who goes crashing over his bar. And it's really obvious that he did not defeat her late husband in personal combat. So she asks for the truth. And I like this line because uh, she says, you must be quite a liar. And he says, it's a gift. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's really pleased with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Compliment. And then she transports him out. Well, yeah, having knocked him out with a Klingon hypo. I like that. A Klingon hypo looks vicious, as it you does. Expect. It looks. <laughs> well, it, it kind of makes me think, well, it looks vicious, but a hypo stops you being jabbed by a needle. So wouldn't a Klingon just jab you with a needle? <laughs> Possibly, but anyway. They've they've made this non-needle thin look pretty horrible all the same. Yeah. And she, another nice touch, she uses Choi Chu to beam her off, which you know, dates right back to Star Trek 3. And she's using the, they, they still have the communicators on their the arms, arms rather yeah. than on the chest. So yeah. that's quite cool. Yeah. So they're on Kronos and De Gaulle lied. He's not a brother. He wants their lands and title. And Grilka could have been special dispensation to lead a house, even though she's a woman. We meet Tumek. Now, I've got him for a tack wing. Oh, right. Weird. He's not exactly a... He just reminds me of Naval the... personnel. No, he reminds me of the... Uh, he's a captain with naught value. Which kind <laughs> of works. But he reminds me of the sort of fox dog thing. What's it called? Mr Didymus in Labyrinth. All right. Well, he's, he's had a long history in TV, and I'm going to have to take a deep breath now just to cover the highlights, all right? Oh, OK. I'll just drink my beer. This is Joseph Ruskin, who was in the original series, playing Mingle-like Galt in the Games Masters of Triskelon. He's a sonar in Insurrection. We won't hold that against him. He was in the amazingly titled TV series, That's My Bush. <laughs> It's Keiko trimming her bush again. <laughs> That's my bush. Oh, it's, it's funny we never saw that in this country, did we? Does bush not have that connotation in the US? I don't know. I, don't know. <laughs> I guess it can't. Uh, Airwolf, Night Rider. So I'm still laughing at that my <laughs> bush. <laughs> well, you would. He's the president in residence. He's kind of in charge. He's got the whole country saying... That's my bush. Life is hard, that's the price of fame. When you're president, everyone knows your name. Hey, what's that thing? It's my bush. I can't believe he's actually in the White House. That's our man. That's my bush. Charlie's <laughs> Angels, BJ and the Bear. The dark... BJ and the Bear, that cannot have the same connotations in the year. No, yeah, it's another unfortunate one that never got shown over here for the, same, the reason yeah. you expect. Just in case <laughs> any of our American listeners don't know what BJ is, it's a blowjob in this country. So you've basically got a TV, you've got, what is it, that's my, we can't say funny because that's bum in the US. That's my vagina, that's yeah. my lady garden as a TV show and blowjob and the bear as another <laughs> TV show. Yeah. 
Yeah, they, the dire Captain America TV movie, Wonder Woman, Starsky and Hutch, The Barnick Woman. Wonder Woman, that's a better tune. Six Million Dollar Man, Mission Impossible, The Man from Uncle. Oh, that's a nice tune and all. And I say, that's just the edited highlights. He's been in all the telly. All the telly. <laughs> all the telly. And it's it's nice to see Cronus again. I haven't seen this since Sins of the Father. Sins of the Father. Certainly we haven't seen The Great on. Hall anyway, and no. that map painting since Sins of the Father. Yeah. No. Anyway, I've been earwormed by that now. <laughs> but no, anything is better than fucking wheels on the bus, believe me. Well, we're going with Kojak at the moment, I think. I don't know the tune. No. I know I've got it, but I don't know it. I can't sing it to myself. So Sins of the Father is better than nothing. Yeah, we've already had that, though. No, 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 I'm not complaining. I've just got to sing something to myself that isn't fucking wheels on the bus. Okay, right. Anyway, Gryuka then turns around to Quark and says, Put this on. Why? Because if you don't, I'll kill you. And he's like, okay. <laughs> um, and they get married. Yeah. Very short wedding ceremony. Yes. <laughs> so what was the house of Kojak is now the house of Quark. Mm-hmm. On Deep Space Nine, you've got Cisco and Dax and Kira, and Miles interrupts, and yeah, it's personal. So Dax is like, I know that look, and tries to get Kira to leave. She's like, it must be a human thing. And then Cisco is like, yeah. uh, you're leaving. It's not very pastoral. She says, oh, have you got troubles with Keiko? Yeah, well, tell the rest of the crew, why don't you? That's a bit mean. Well, it's not the whole crew. It's... All right, the senior officers then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. At course. least she sorted her hair out anyway. This is true. She hasn't got... Although, when we get to Trill in your episode, you get woman with shit hair, don't you? Um, I hadn't noticed. Well, it seems to be a Trill hairstyle anyway. Miles is asking if he can fit an empty cargo bay into an arboretum. And Cisco's like, yeah, Bay 21 will do. Half of it doesn't work anyway as a cargo bay, so you may as well use it to plant trees. On Kronos, enter Quark into the, oh... The Great Hall. That's it. Mm-hmm. Um, which is also, I just love that shot, because it's like this massive hall full of warriors and this little Quark. Yeah. They, interestingly, the set, they only built one half of it and basically reversed the shot each time to okay. save a bit of money. And basically, there's a, a ritual called the Brechtel Ritual, which is where a widow whose husband dies in honourable combat can marry the victor, which is all very women as prizes, which I really don't like. But anyway, in this... It's very Klingon, sadly, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, in this case, Grilka is using it to her advantage, and she's saying she's married Quark. So now it's the house of Quark, which Garon can't pronounce. Quark. Yay, Garon's back! Oh, Robert awesome. O'Reilly, old stary eyes. Yeah, brilliant. Won't be the last time we see him either. <laughs> the thing is, though, see, whenever I see him wearing the, I don't know what you call it, cloak of office, mm-hmm. I remember that you are too fat Kempek. And yeah. I think it's the same one because it looks. It is, I think. Yeah, but it looks far too big for him. Do you know what I mean? That's probably why. Okay. <laughs> but it was built for Star Trek V originally, or built, yeah, made. But, uh, yes, Robert O'Reilly and Arm and Shimon both old friends, which helped oh, their right. chemistry together. So. Okay, cool. But, yeah, it's good to see. Oh, and Quark sporting quite an, a natty Klingon robe as well. Yeah, I like it. Quite cool. It's probably a child's, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <say>. probably. <laughs> and then you're back at Grilka's place and Quark basically says, look, you've got no idea what to do next and suggests a more equal partnership rather than her being told what to do. And it turns out that Grilka's house has got financial problems caused by Kojak's gambling debt. And Quark's like, well, if that's what the problem is, show me stuff, I can help, I can sort it out. And she's like, oh, we don't have anything to do with filthy ledgers. And he's like, well, it's not going to hurt to let me look at your filthy ledgers. Then you cut back to DS9, and Bashir is looking at the chief's pad while he's ordering plumeek soup with a touch of basil. Yeah, that's a Vulcan dish from the original series. Oh, okay. Bashir is right about this. He basically turns around to Miles and says, look, you can't expect Keiko to turn her profession into a hobby. You wouldn't be happy doing the same. Keiko's a botanist, so she needs to be a botanist. And then you cut back to Kronos, and it turns out that Dagor has been scheming and plotting like a Ferengi, and basically devaluing the uh, the land and property that Kojak's house have. I love the way that Quark talks them through this, and clearly they're just <sighs> they're struggling to follow it at all. At one point, uh, Garon just throws his pad to the floor in mm. disgust, which apparently that was improvised by Robert O'Reilly. Yeah. It's, it's brilliant. Look at these these like burly Klingons looking down at these pads, clearly confused by <laughs> maths. You know, it's just I love it. Whoever those extras were, they were they they acted well. Mm. You know, 
don't know whether an advert went out of <laughs> extras wanted who don't like maths. <laughs> <laughs> but it's brilliant. It's not just... I mean, yes, the fact that Garon throws the pad down in disgust is brilliant. But actually, all the Klingons in the room looking confused at these pads while Quark talks them through finances. Yeah, I, I like it. All the scene is well acted. I love that scene. And it's just like, you are saying that de Gaulle is dishonourable or whatever. De Gaulle turns around and says he has a witness to say it wasn't an honourable death. And then Quark's like, but there's only one person who could possibly know and in comes Rom. No, Rom. <laughs> yeah. And then back at Grilko's, you get introduced to the Klingon dartboard. Yeah, it's a sort of decorative thing on the back wall. It, hasn't, it looks like a dartboard. It board. hasn't got enough segments to be a Why dartboard. Why maybe Klingons but... play darts differently? <laughs> right, okay. That's what it looks like to me. They probably play with huge darts that can knock your head off as well. Probably. But to be fair, though, darts are actually genuinely offensive weapons. I mean, mm-hmm. if you threw a dart in someone's eye, they'd die. Haven't we seen a movie where somebody kills someone by throwing a dart in their eye? Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. Does it happen in Shaun of the Dead? Might do. So then you've got Rom and Quark are going to be leaving, and Grilka is very disparaging. And then Rom and Quark have the discussion about he's obviously applied to make them feel guilty, and it's not going to work, and Latin's more important, and they go off. And then you cut to the Great Hall and Grilk was sort of pacing up and down and there's no sign of Quark. And De Gaulle's like, well, you know, there's no one to answer this challenge, so I want their, their title and their lands and everything. And then Quark appears and I love this. He says, I am Quark, son of Keldar, and I have come to answer the challenge of De Gaulle, son of whatever. <laughs> brilliant. So it looks like they're going to be properly facing off for a fight. And then in a brilliant ploy, Quark throws his bat left on the floor and says, Go ahead. Kill me! That is why I'm here, isn't it? To be killed? Well, here I am. So go ahead and do it. You all want me to pick up that sword and fight him, don't you? But I don't have a chance, and you know it. You only want me to put up a fight so that your precious honor will be satisfied. Well, I'm not going to make it so easy for you. Having me fight De Gore is nothing more than an execution. So, if that's what you want, that's what you'll get. An execution. No honor. No glory. And when you tell your children and your grandchildren the glorious story of how you rose to power and took Grilka's house from her, I hope you remember to tell them how you heroically killed an unarmed Ferengi. Half your size. Tagore is like, well, whatever. And Garon interrupts. And then you get the, a repeat of the scene, what they did to Wolf. Yeah, and since, it's the, since father. the father. And they, like, they're just like, no, you don't just go and execute some Ferengi, you dishonourable twat. Not that they say that, but that's mm-hmm. clearly what they think. And they all cross their hands and turn their back on him. That's yep. it. He's done and dusted. <laughs> nice. And then you have Gowron saying that Quark is a brave Ferengi, like he can't believe the words that are coming out of his own mouth. Yeah. And then you have Grilka, and so Grilka is granted the special dispensation. Yeah, Gowron's yeah. actually nice in this for a change. Yeah. yeah. But it's obvious, though. He says, I think there are enough extenuating <laughs> circumstances, and you're thinking, yeah, this is fairly unusual, isn't oh. it? So Grilka has got the special dispensation, and she says, how can I repay you? And um, Quark's like, I'd like a divorce, please. No offence. <laughs> and then you get basically slap, spit, snog. Yes. <laughs> the the slap, spit is the divorce. The snog, I think, is a little bonus she gives yeah. him. <laughs> and she's like, kapla. And he's like, kapla to you too. I really yeah. like. Yeah. <laughs> I want that on a t-shirt. <laughs> and then back on Deep Space Nine, you've got Keiko and Miles. And sort of the upper bit of the promenade that kind of overlooks Quarks. But I've never been sure if he technically is Quarks or not. There's an upper level in Quarks. That is is part that of where his. they are? I think so, yes. Yes, it is. Miles is like, look, there's an expedition on Bajor that's looking for a chief botanist. And it's like for six months. And she's like, I can't go away for six months. And he's like, yeah, you can take Molly with you. And Bajor's only three hours away. And she's like, oh, but when I agreed to come with you, I made a promise. And he's like, yeah, but, you know, I want you to be happy. Which is nice. I like it. It's mm-hmm. quite sweet. But I can't help thinking that Miles is going to have a better life if she's on fucking Bajor. <laughs> she can trim her fucking bush on fucking Bajor, can't she? <laughs> the, this was a specific effort by the writing staff to write Keiko out, basically. Yeah. Oh, what a shame. So they could explore the O'Brien-Bashir relationship a bit more. Yeah. Hooray! <laughs> to be fair, though, it's actually a nice contrast. 
you've got two women in the story. The one who is more downtrodden is taking control of her own destiny, going against her culture. And the other could be sort of mopey and her, her culture doesn't oppress her, but in a way her circumstances do. And she's now going off to become... A botanist. So you've got the parallel mm-hmm. of the two, well, do, the, the two yeah. women who both end up in control of their own destinies at the end, mm. but for sort of in a slightly different way. And I like that contrast. So yeah, okay, maybe they just wanted to write her out, but they wrote her out in a good way, in a yes. positive way that I think works particularly well in this episode. And, and to be fair, this is her best story in a long time. So <laughs> yeah, and she's nice in this. Did the people writing this not know? <laughs> And then you end with Rom wanting to hear Quark's story again. Which is kind of sweet. Yeah, he yeah. is. He's, he is sweet. But overall, I really like this episode. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of fun. My favourite scene has to be all the Klingons there with their pads trying to understand <laughs> fine. Like, it's just brilliant. It's yeah. amazing. But even though he's not in it much, Robert O'Reilly as Garon is really good. The Klingons are good. Grilka's good. Yeah, just the whole thing. I love it. Yeah, excellent. It was originally going to be titled Fight to the Death, for obvious reasons, and was written by Klingon expert Ron Moore, who also wrote Sins of the Father. So they didn't ever consider Keiko Trimzer Bush then? No, apparently not. Uh, It was one of Schumerman's favourite episodes, unsurprisingly. Mm, I can imagine. It's great to see Gary on the High Council again, isn't it? Yeah. And when when even your Keiko B story is good, you know you're on to a winner, really, aren't you? Yeah. Although that it is partly because she's leaving. <laughs> yeah, but for a bit. You know, I mean, she will be back. I mean, she's leaving, but in a, in a good way. Yeah, she's not just forgotten about or or leaving in a crap hissy fit or something. Yeah. <laughs> so excellent episode. Good Yay. fun, I think. Let's find out what other people think. We'll start with Sambo. Hello. Here is some feedback for House of Quark. I have to admit, when originally viewing Deep Space Nine, Quark was never one of my favourite characters. I guess I was too young to appreciate the different aspects of him as a character and only saw him as comic relief. With this rewatch, he's become one of my favourites. Many episodes having the best dialogue and also being more heroic and resourceful than I remembered him being. It's true, even in a bad episode, if it's got a quark scene, it usually makes it. This episode is my favourite quark episode so far. Accidentally killing a Klingon, taking credit for it, allows Quark some great dialogue, as well as excellent looks of disbelief from Odo. Yep. But the story really gets going when Quark gets kidnapped. First, it seems that Quark is just being dragged along some Klingon intrigue, but he starts taking control surprisingly quickly. I really enjoy Quark giving a PowerPoint lecture about yeah, economics to Garon, brilliant. with Garon bugging his eyes out in disgust. Yep. And in the duel with de Gaulle, Quark shows more courage and cunning than we've seen out of him so far. Excellent stuff. Yep. And then there was some kind of B-plot about Keiko being significant for two things. First of all, O'Brien manages to say the words, I'm married to the most wonderful woman in the galaxy with a straight face. Uh. Secondly, the show finally acknowledges to some degree that just setting up a school with Coco probably wasn't the best of ideas, taking into account that she's a botanist and all. <laughs> this episode was really excellent, being so full of excellent scenes between Quark and Klingons that I can't even remember half of them t- for this feedback. Needless to say, I really enjoyed watching it. Hey, so did Yay. you. Excellent. Thank you. We also heard from Leggett Brian. And he writes... Before I give my feedback for House of Quark, I have to say I didn't dislike the episode. That being said, I felt it came along at the wrong time. We ended the previous season with the Jemadar before beginning this season with the great reveal of the USS Hideki. Sorry, Peter. Yeah, that's Cardassian uh, fighter craft that it's the front half is kind of based on. The front half of what? Of the Defiant. Oh, OK. The ones that look a bit like crap fish. Yes. I mean, the, the rear half looks nothing like, so they get they just about get away with it. And the revelation of the changelings being the founders of the Dominion. Both of these were galaxy-shaping events. They should have a massive impact on things in the Alpha Quadrant. Apparently, that impact is fewer people are going to Quark's bar. Well, not just that, but lots of people are leaving the station, actually. That's the point. So it does have an, you know, I say, I quite like the fact it has a, a wider impact. He says, I could almost hear the clutch going at the sudden change of gear. Last season, we had The Wire and Tribunal, two quite heavy stories, and I feel House of Quark would have fi- nicely lifted the atmosphere a little before diving into the Dominion up with the Jemadar, but maybe that's just me. Anyway, I love the looks on Bashir and Odo's faces as Quark tells his story. But wait! Odo is still on the security staff. Wasn't there at least some sort of court of inquiry into his relations with the other changelings? That's not to say anything against Odo, but it just seems lax of Starfleet. Actually, do we ever get an explanation as to what to happen? Because at the end of the other one, when they find out that the the changelings are the founders, 
We don't hear that Odo's been reinstated, do we? Um, he was never fired or anything. Well, because there was this head of Starfleet. No, no, Cisco made the point that Odo wasn't being replaced. It was just there would be certain issues that they would be turning to Eddington for when it comes to purely Starfleet matters, which is obviously muscling into Odo's business a bit, but isn't deposing him as head of station security. That was the point. So you reckon that after the whole changing thing, Odo's all right with the situation? Well, I don't think he's all right with it, as we'll be finding out later on, but he's just getting on with his job, basically. Okay. The rest of the main story is what, after a fun, light-hearted tale which had a few chuckles, seemed a bit of an anticlimax after the season opener. As for the B-plot, I'd forgotten all about it until I, saw the, until I saw the credits and debated whether or not to skip the Keiko scenes, but decided that in the interest of fair and unbiased reporting, I would watch the whole thing. All I would say is kudos to O'Brien for keeping a straight face in that last scene. It's <laughs> all about you being a botanist. Like, bloody hell. He was really thinking, it's about getting rid of you in the politest way I can. <laughs> <laughs> now it's time to see if Equilibrium is anything like I remember it. Mm. Mm. I, I disagree. I think, actually, what you needed was a light comedy episode after yeah. the heavy season opener. So I think they made the right decision. I think, for me, actually, it's difficult to judge because... In between watching the season opener and this, I watched and hated Generation. <laughs> well, yes, that probably has slightly spoiled our uh, approach to it. But yeah, yeah, so I don't know how it would feel to go from <laughs> the season opener to this. <laughs> I've gone game. from a massive pile of wank to this. And I'm like, hooray! <laughs> so I'm, I kind of don't feel I can make a comment on that aspect, to be fair. Let's hear what Dory made of it. I like the funny storyline of this episode. It showed how Quark, thinking about two steps ahead, congratulating himself for doing so, is often nowhere near enough. <laughs> I love the number of times I just thought, OK, so this is what's happening, only for another character, or perhaps a situation, to happen, to come along and change everything. I like Grilka. Not Notoff. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, well spotted. She was great. The insight into Klingon culture was nice, and Quark trying to explain the accounting irregularities to the Council was a great scene. Yep. The non-verbal acting was great, including from Klingon characters who were not part of the main action. Yes, absolutely. I hope Keiko will be happier from now on <laughs> when we see her, now that Miles has told her to go off and be a botanist. Mm, I wouldn't hold your breath for that. <laughs> no. I'm now wondering if it's like, you know, when you're being sent to Coventry, you can now be replaced with go off and be a botanist. Or being sent to Bajor, yeah. <laughs> and we've also heard from the Mark. Who writes, the House of Quark, or Klingon Territorial Laws, or Son of... Whatever. <laughs> Watched this last night and thought it was a wonderful episode to follow on from the heavy search two parter. Mm. So totally opposite yeah. view to. <laughs> I guess when the writers need a lightweight episode, they can always count on Armin Shimmerman to get the job done. Most of the time, anyway. It's a good Klingon episode and one of the best Quark vehicles yet. The widow of the Klingon, who Quark has claimed he has killed, Natoth, sorry, Grilka, comes to DS9 and abducts Quark to the Klingon homeworld. Odo has a squee and goes on the first holiday since Quark last got abducted one whole story ago. When Toph forces him to marry her so she can keep a claim on her family, house and land under Klingon territorial laws. Sounds like a contrivance? It is, but who cares? Now Quark and Toph must work together to convince the High Council that the land should not fall into the hands of the rival Klingon de Gore, who is an honourless opportunist anyway. I especially liked when the pint-sized Ferengi marched into the chamber of the High Council wearing a powerful-looking cloak and announcing in a powerful voice his claim to the House of Quark. Quark's 11th hour display of courage is surprisingly refreshing. And the whole episode, I was bracing myself for another display of Quark grovelling at move-along-home cringe levels. Mm. Instead, I get a thrown bat left and come at me, bro. <laughs> yeah, nice, yeah. I think Garon's face as he looks over at Quark's figures is just funny. He's demonstrating the economic warfare in the High Council in front of a bunch of confused, angry Klingons is one of the episode's highlights. For gods of war that Klingons like to think they are, they have a very root one way of thinking about things. Klingon tactics come down to, do I punch him in the face or kick him in the face? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've talked before about how Quark's lack of pride compared to someone like Sisko works as a strength sometimes. The Klingons are much more intensely proud, and so the contrast with Quark pops all the more. The episode is then about Quark's gradually taking on the mantle of courage and honour, while still being uniquely himself. This really is an episode about a Klingon Ferengi wedding, insofar as we get a merging of Klingon Ferengi values in Quark and Grilka. 
Interesting that no one on the station seems to care that, in the way the story is portrayed, both Quark and Wrong were kidnapped. That's a good point, actually. Because mm. Odo said in the past that, you know, although he doesn't like Quark, he still kind of wants him around and he's like, you know, know thine enemy kind of thing. So mm. he's surprised that Odo doesn't do anything, actually. Comes to their rescue, yes. What's likely to be overlooked here is the not horrid B story involving Keiko. <laughs> Miles tries to lift Keiko's spirits, who feels useless on the station without a career, an issue that most of the people of the Federation just don't seem to care about with limitless power and replicators. It's the ones with jobs who are crazy, but it's nice to see them in scenes where they're doing something besides arguing, and seeing Miles and Keiko really trying to make their relationship work is refreshing, showing that real relationships take a bit of effort. The story satirises Klingon culture while also being affectionate of it. And you can't ask for more than that. True. That's true. And in terms of the having a career, not having a career, I read a long screed on Tumblr about jobs in the Federation when you don't get paid for what you do and stuff. And the best equivalent is that Everyone has what they need, but potentially you can have more than that for a start. But also, it's about people who do volunteering, if you think of it in that. If you don't need to work, yep. like you're active retired in this country is a, is a good example, but you might want to be making a difference to your society, that's supposed to be the ethos that the Federation has. Ah, there we go. Cheers, Mark. Thank you. Right, let's find out what Purry made of this one. Hello Arcs, party here to talk about the House of Quark, or a welcome to the House of Quark, now I've come, Muffy. welcome to the, anyway, enough of that, um, so yeah, this episode now, it's one of the things, it actually also cropped up as one of my friend's criticisms many years ago, um, after a similar big story like The Search in season four, uh, that at that point, we were beginning to get used to Babylon 5, frankly, having an arc and following things up. And so it all surprises us when Deep Space Nine uh, takes a bit of a different turn. So we have the big launch of the Dominion uh, sort of appearing and the Defiant and everything, only to go uh, for the following episode to be a comedy kind of Ferengi Klingon episode. Some might say it's left field, some might say it's terrible. I actually really like it. I almost like the way that uh, they gave us these wee breaks, these wee sort of comedy interludes, often with the Ferengi, which I know rubbed some people at the wrong way but this one's actually particularly for those who hate the kind of screaming in Ferengi episodes this one's actually pretty good and um, it takes a while to get going I do remember more going on on Quonos um, but uh, regardless it's just so much fun so Quark accidentally kills a Klingon makes himself a legend um, and I mean it is Odo's sort of look when Quark is you know sort of saying yep I had no choice I I, I killed him and um, it is Odo kind of sort of going oh I know that's bollocks but if you're not willing to change your story uh, so be it and um, yeah this, this sort of stuff once they get uh, you know Grill marries him and uh, they get to Kronos and I mean there's that slight issue that no one in Deep Space Nine um noticed at all that Quark went missing for a few days. And Rom. Who was running Quark's? I mean, surely Morn would have reported the missing or something. Um, that's, that was just one of my thoughts on it. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's actually they're tied up in the B-plot of O'Brien trying to make Keiko happier, which I quite liked. I think it was. To be honest, I got the feeling that the creators knew that uh, the O'Brien-Keiko relationship wasn't working that well, and so, quite frankly, kind of shoveling her off to Canada, or Bajor in this case, um, was probably the best move, because while it doesn't, you know, you still get to keep O'Brien as a married man with a kid, but you don't have the family life in the station, as it just wasn't really a part of the show that was particularly working well. On the other hand, um, you put you you know back to Quark and Konos. You've got uh, Quark basically uh, getting into Klingon culture, which is horribly sexist. Apparently, a woman can't become Chancellor of the High Council unless her husband dies in special circumstances. Um, I like the idea that Grilka was actually thumbing her nose at that as well and saying, "Well, fine, but a Ferengi man can be a Ferengi man can be that." So here we go, absolute against our old rights, which apparently you're all obsessed with. The man who killed my husband can take the wife. There you go. Um, and it's quite fun. Um, 
you know, the fact that Quark sort of unveils the fact that, uh, I can't remember the other Klingon's name, but he's trying to take a house dishonourable using uh, sneaky financial uh, you know, sort of transactions. I, I did quite like that, that that was something that could get him kicked out. <laughs> um, you know, whereas if he just stabbed the guy, that would have been fine. Oh, you got to love the Klingons. So yeah, overall it's just fun, and it's kind of Quark and Grilka skirting around each other, um, except, you know, for you would get the, oh yeah, they're kind of loving each other. It's not really, <laughs> you just look at the feel that like Grilka doesn't really like him. Um, although there is that quite nice bit at the end where she's impressed with him. And I did like, it's also quite a sweet moment with Quark and uh, Rom at the end. Rom saying, I want to hear the story again, because Quark's saying, no, no one's impressed with it. And it's just the fact that there is a bit of this in Quark that we're seeing. And I think it's partly because when he took Cisco to task, um, but also we're getting to see this part of Quark that, yeah, he might find, that he finds that the Ferengi are laughed at and kind of the bum joke of the universe. And frankly, he's not too happy with it. And so he'd like there to be legendary Ferengi, just once uh, he'd like someone to be able to sit there and say, other than I got ripped off by Ferengi, something did something impressive. And I really like that. It's a nice, interesting aspect to his character, which we do see more of later on. So yeah, overall, for all this, it's not a deep, dark episode. It's probably never going to be anyone's favourite. I found it immense fun, and just... Uh, a good episode, uh, well written and good fun, well acted. I don't think you can really ask for more. Well, you could probably ask for deep and involving plot, but this was an absolute joy, so I've got no problems with it. So I'll be back shortly to talk about Equilibrium. Until then, bye for now. Bye! I love that tune! Welcome to the house of Quark, now I've come yeah. yes. <laughs> Not bad, not bad. I think this in some ways feels more like a Klingon episode than the Ferengi one, what with yeah. it being set on Kronos and everything, and yeah, okay, you you learn a bit about Frankie, but actually, it's it's mostly about the Klingons. Yeah, and uh, the the distrust of of Frankie type financial yeah uh, school duggery. So yeah. and their sexism because you learn about oh, well, yeah. that's, that's we knew that already. But, yeah, yeah, but it's, it's amplified, I think. But yeah, he, he picks on the up on the same thing that we did about quite wanting legendary Frankie and him not being happy with the way his race are viewed, and also on Legget Brian's point. Uh, about nobody responding to Quark and Rom's absence, and I have yeah, to wonder: Did Morn just go and raid the bar? <laughs> probably, he was probably in charge again and drank all the profits again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's hear what Drew and Tracy thought of this one. Hello, this is our feedback for Deep Space Nine episode House of Quark. Go. Well, I this was a Klingon heavy episode. Yeah. Not my favourite. Why? Uh, I don't know. But I think, like, it had a lot of quark in it. And just in the middle of it, I just started thinking, this is actually a really good episode. This was a fun episode. It was I really fun. enjoyed it. Yeah. I, I do like quark. And this is quark at his best. He was very kind of witty and funny. Yeah. Um, the Klingons, I, I don't mind them. You know, they yeah. they were quite good in this episode. Um, yeah, I, I just enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it as well. It was uh, some funny bits. We liked it when uh, when they got married. Yeah. And he didn't know what's going on. And then when he got divorced. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was so funny when she socked him one. Yeah. And actually, I did say to you at one point, for a Klingon, she's actually quite pretty. I know, yeah. She's she, quite attractive. Yeah. She she wasn't too bad looking, actually. Yeah. The storyline was a little bit obvious, though, I think, after... Um, yeah. You know, he was really pushing to, oh, I'm going to be historic, you know, or, you know like, heroic here. The Klingons were going to come for you, mate. It was obvious. Mm. I, yeah, I think it's all very predictable um, once the, the wheels got in motion, what was happening. Yeah. But, yeah, it's, I think it's in, predictable but enjoyable, yeah. funny. Uh, yeah. And, you know, Shane Quark off to be a, a good character that we know he is. As a sideline, is Keiko going off to do other projects for six months? Because this had almost no bearing on like yeah, the actual episode I don't you know? know what's this going on and then you had the token scene which just placed um cisco dax and kira for no yes. reason whatsoever it had no bearing on the episode no, what, I guess whatsoever. So. i i don't know what's going on with keiko or whether this is um where we went here or whatever but yeah, yeah well, that was just like the b plot wasn't it yeah. oh they could have easily have left that out I absolutely think, in this. but it was quite sweet how miles was very much trying to cheer her up and I'm sorry, He's but a good husband. I want um, an I'm Named Tracy Day. <laughs> yeah. You know, not an I'm Fabulous Wife Day. I want an I Want Tracy Day. Oh, perhaps we have to arrange that. I think we should. Yeah. We did laugh at the beginning in the opening sequence when Morn pulled. It was like, 
Come oh, on, yeah. sunshine, let's have it. And then he flicks the uh, to clock. Up, that they? was really funny. Yeah, that was good. That was good to see. I really enjoyed this episode. It wasn't stupid or anything. It was it was Just funny. Enjoyable fun. Yeah, you didn't like it because the Klingons were in it. But no, I, I did like it because I think there was enough Ferengi stuff in it. Yeah, yeah. It was good. No, I enjoyed it. I thought this was a good fun, episode. Fun, enjoyable. Yeah. Let's have some more of this. Definitely. Leave it there then. Okay. Lovely. See you later. Bye. Bye. See you later. Can yeah. I have I want ammo day? Yeah, I'm sure you'd like that, yes. Yes, please. <laughs> and I shall make you a can of peas. <laughs> <laughs> no. Sort the food. Let's just have the fucking... <laughs> We will see Keiko again, but not very often. This kind of this is basically a way of writing her out a bit without writing writing her out completely. But cleverly by moving her off the station, it means that O'Brien then has got to start relating a bit more to the other characters, which I think is a very good move. Good, glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. It is good fun. Okay, let's move on to our next episode then. A nightmare is taking possession of her soul. Who are you? Turning Dax against her own people. Dax. Jadzia. Now each vision of violence. They're not dreams. Actually, they're memories. Brings her closer to the truth. I'm afraid we'll have to remove the symbiont. But that'll kill Jadzia. And closer to the brink of death. She's in neural shock. Next time on Star Trek Deep Space Nine. So equilibrium. That trailer made it sound a lot more exciting than it actually was. I really liked it. Yeah, I found it rather dull. But anyway, Cisco is cooking for the officers and Jake is wearing that top again. Oh, bussy top. <laughs> we learn Cisco is from New Orleans and his father being a chef is referenced. Oh, I can't remember if that's the first time or not. but No, I think it's the second mm. time, but the first time it, it was done in a way that kind of implies he was dead. Yeah, that's right, yes. Odo is helping by stirring the souffle really strangely and gets told it's all in the wrist. Fanar. Fanar. Kira thinks it looks cute. Fanar. <laughs> <laughs> he does, though. Dax finds an old keyboard of Jake's, which looks a tad Fisher Price. He does. <laughs> Despite none of her hosts having any musical ability, she finds she can play a tune. Terry Farrell, on the other hand, can play, which is why she looks fairly natural doing it. Oh, OK. Rather than, um... Oh, no, who... Was it Picard? No, it wasn't Picard. It was Picard's... Love interest who played yeah. the roll out piano. Season six episode. That had a yeah. hand double and it was obvious. Yours. Uh, the tune is kind of a sort of slowed down version of the Deep Space Nine theme, so it's all sort of whiffly waffly and doesn't go anywhere, but there we are. And our teaser is her playing that on the keyboard. Yeah, bit of a Whoa. shit teaser, really. Scary stuff. No, it's a crap no. teaser. I'm not denying that. It is yeah. a crap teaser. It should have been. It could have. They, the only way of making that tense and exciting is if Richard's still not dead had turned up and started Ugh. playing. By the way, is he dead yet? Can I? Because I, as soon as he does die, if he hasn't already, then I, I have to stop calling him Richard still not dead. Yeah, it's a bit like why is Rod Hull still alive? He isn't anymore. You can't do that joke yeah, anymore. Yeah, oh, I better, I better Google. I know that's. Oh dear, it's really <laughs> bad already. <laughs> Paul Daniels just having died. I've been I very know. good, although I. Is it just me that's imagining at his funeral they're going to cut his coffin in half? <laughs> Sorry. No. No. Bad, bad pizza. Now you see me, now you don't. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, was, that, was that too soon? Def, you'll like it. Not a lot. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if that was too soon. That was, yes, yeah, sorry. Poor taste. All right. Richard still go. Does he still go? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, now it just makes me think of Finders Keepers. Did you watch that? I don't think I did. Oh, oh he's still with us at the age of 72. Thank heavens. Okay. I can still take the P out of his surname. Splendid. Let's move on before he dies. God, if he dies in between me uh, recording this coming out, it's going to look really bad. It is, yeah. He is currently alive. He still goes. Richard's anyway. still not dead. You have to carry on living for at least another week. Yes. <laughs> Then we have Dax and Cisco playing good old-fashioned 2D chess. And Dax is annoying him by humming the same tune. I know what that's like. Do I do that, then? Uh, everybody does that from time to time. When you've got an earworm, you, you hum it again and again. Uh, she accuses him of cheating at one point and has a strop and throws all the pieces on the floor. Acting very out of character, she also storms out on Kira as well. So it's, it's a nice performance by Farrell, because it's yeah. obviously rather different to what we're used to. 
In a wonderfully spooky shot, she walks along the promenade and all, all goes dark. Everyone disappears and a spooky figure with a creepy mask face is everywhere she looks. And he kind of takes the face off and there's another one behind uh, it. Which the is kind Phantom of the Opera is here <laughs> inside your mind. Betty. Anyway, what? <laughs> it was the same guy, wasn't it? Was it? Yes. <laughs> okay. Some of us do have him, guy. What's his name? Oh, Frank. Yeah. Michael Crawford, isn't it? Anyway, the concept of the episode was born from Michael Pilar seeing the guy who plays Spooky Mask Face, Jeff McBride. Uh, he, got a, he basically did a magic show. Um, you know where my brain has gone? Where's your brain gone? Jason. Hockey Mask. Oh, right, okay. No, it's not as creepy as that. No, but, you know, yeah. he's, like, he's going to be there with a the chain tool. Now, um, it turns out the character's name is Duran Bilar, but it, the guy who plays him, according to IMDb, he was an uncredited crewman in Star Trek II. Ooh. But there's nothing about it on M- Memory Alpha, so I'm not sure if that's just somebody putting in a bit of crapola on IMDb, which can happen. And also he played a bodyguard in Leon, apparently. Hmm, don't know. Anyway, Dax comes round from her strange dream state uh, when she bumps into Quark and se- sensibly checks herself into the infirmary. Bashir discovers one of her previous hosts was involved in a shuttle crash, which may have caused some sort of trauma. He recommends taking her back to the Trill homeworld to get her seen to. So they take the Defiant, which struck me as odd. You know, they take this great big battleship away from the station they're supposed to be defending, right by the wormhole they're supposed to be guarding, uh, when they could have, after all, taken a runabout. But actually, Anne-Marie, I'm I'm clearly rubbing off on you, because then you pointed out that warp speed of the Defiant is 9.5, and the runabout I did remember the figures. You didn't remember, you just knew that the Defiant was faster, which is true, because yes, the Defiant is 9.5, whereas the runabout's top speed is warp 5. So speed is of the essence, it makes sense to take the Defiant, I guess. Well, if they, if uh, whatever it was, I suppose, I mean, I think they said levels dropped mm. below 40%, they'd have to take out the symbiote, which means Jazzy would die, and they've already dropped to 73%, so yep. that's quite a long way in a comparatively short space of time. So Apparently speak. there's been some changes on the Defiance Bridge, but I did not notice a single one of them, so call me Mr. Unobservant. Oh, dear, and you're the one who I know. wants to do Let's Get Angel about the Ready Room. Yeah, 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 well, see, if you'd seen the Ready Room, I could have told you. Dax comes... We don't see it for a long time, by the way. We do see it, but not for a long while. Dax comes to Bashir's quarters in her PJs. Presumably, no, she's a nighty. Yes, well, presumably her quarters are near his then. She hasn't been wandering halfway around the ship just in a nighty. His PJs have a cute collar. Very reminiscent to the Next Generation uniform, actually. Makes you wonder whether it's Starfleet issue. Although, of course, on the Enterprise, they all had different casual-type yeah. uh, PJs, didn't they? So, Well, it's a Mandarin collar, isn't it? Yes. Maybe he just likes them. Maybe he does. I can't help feeling I'm not going to be very comfortable to sleep in, but anyway. They start talking about the fact that she's having to go back to the Trill Initiate compound, which does sound very grim. Just reminds me of being back at theological college, really. <laughs> yeah. Dax confesses to being afraid of doctors, which Julian admits he was too. And let's face it, that's something most of us have. We tend to avoid them. He invites her to stay in his room, which she's grateful for, and there's no sense of lechiness, which is good. Yeah. Sign of progress. Actually, um, uh, Alexander Cedric likes how, how the episode showed Julian and Dax now have a professional relationship. Yeah. It's not about him letching all over anymore. Even though she's in her nighty. Even though she's in her nighty, yes. But we're a third of the way through the episode and nothing much has happened, it has to be said, other than a bit of scary mask face action. There's a nice mat of the Trill homeworld, which is brand new and looks very swish. Inside the lab place, it all is predicted to be light and federation-y, as you'd expect. They have an interesting design ethic when it comes to monitors, which are huge and chunky and look like they come from the 1980s. You kind of expect them to go, Well, bring me R. Oh, stop, I stop it. That, stop that it. That is correct. No, Hello-do. stop it. I hate that voice. And they also use sort of frisbee like pads. Very odd. We meet Dr. Renhol, who seems friendly enough. Was it, was it her that had funny hair, do yeah. you think? <clears throat> I must admit, I did, it didn't strike me as If you look at it, particularly from behind, you can see it's all been tucked up in a weird way that's quite reminiscent of the way that Jazzy oh, was yeah. tucked up in a weird way. It's not identical, but it kind of creates the impression that there are currently fa- old hairstyles fashionable on trip at the moment. Mm-hmm. Daxi is wandering around the Defiance, and she has another spooky moment with a man in the mask. 
And two Trill, who we later find out are supposed to be dressed in outfits over 100 years old. Not that they particularly look it. Come to take her away. Ha ha, he he. She defends herself and comes to just before punching Bashir's lights out. I like that. Bit of action at last. Dax suggests going to see the Guardians. Not the Guardians of the Galaxies, that bunch of a-holes. Nope. They're the unjoined Trill who look after the symbionts in the cave set that we see so often, which has got a big pool of milky water this time. Milky, milky. Now, it reminded me of something. What did it remind me of? Paper mache. Oh, right. Before it's actually set or anything, and it Uh, all looks all gloopy. Yeah. Yes, it reminds me of something, but let's not go to that. Sadly, the, 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 then we get to see some of the symbionts in the water, and they just look like giant floaters, don't they? <laughs> we finally meet a guardian to distract us from the floaters. Uh, Timor, who's played by Nicholas Cascone, who was previously Ensign Davis, one of the poor schmucks placed under Wesley's command in Pen Bowels, mm. way back in Series 2. Uh, it was also in Titanic, apparently. Didn't drown in milky water there, I don't think. Yeah. It's a nicely eccentric performance. I quite like him in this, but there we are. Well, they're kind of built up to be a bit odd, aren't yeah. they? He's using a prop that's been doing the rounds on Next Generation since season one, that crappy one about the the mud creatures. It looks like a really bad disco strap-on. Yeah, it's not good. Timor knows Dax is experiencing memories of a former host and takes her away to look into it. Apparently. That's what he says he's going to do. <laughs> Let me have a look at your symbiont. Mm. Back on the Defiant, they found the music Dax was playing, and it was written by somebody called Duran Bilal. And uh, we learn that the symbionts lose their surnames when they become joined. Uh, we never learned what Chadsey is, was though. Duran's image makes Dax see more memories, with an old dude getting stabbed in the back of the neck by the man in the mask, which is a bit gruesome. She removes his mask to reveal Duran, and then Dax goes into neural shock. Laid up in a hospital, this is the first time that we see that Dax's spots go all the way down to her toes, which is nice. Renault suggests uh, the wormhole may have affected Jad's ear. There's a risk they'll have to remove the symbiont, killing her in the process, lending the episode some jeopardy, I guess. Cisco and Julian go and see Timor, but he's become evasive, and it's obvious he's been got to. Uh, Julian does research on the Defiant, discovers Duran's records have been altered, they also find out that he died on the same day that Curzon got the worm, which is a big hint. They hail Duran's brother, who they've traced, who's a very old trill. I like this guy. Oh, I just found this scene so... T- it was just a massive info dump. Boring. We find out that his brother had murdered a doctor that turned him down for joining, but that Joe Lerner t- told him at one point that he'd been joined, which doesn't make much sense. And I say, I just find it a turgid. You know, they're just standing there talking to him on the view screen. And they could have gone and visited him at least. That would have been a little more interesting. But there we are. Cisco and Julian confront Renhol with what they've worked out that Duran's joining means that anybody can be joined, not the one in a thousand they've well, it's advertised. Half. Yes, it turns out later to be a half, but initially they, they, they reckon it means that anybody can be. I mean, let's face it, it was, you know, psycho like him can be that worries you about the other half that can't be joined, yeah. really. What's wrong with them? Bloody neck. Cisco threatens her with exposing the truth if Jadzia dies, uh, the hard negotiator as ever. The only solution is to reintegrate Joe Loran's memories completely with Dax, which has risks of its own. And eventually, they make the correct decision to wake her up and ask her what she wants to do. Yep. It involves Jadzia bathing with the floaters in the pool of Milky Milky. Lovely. Duran surfaces, presumably this is only happening in her mind, otherwise it doesn't make any sense at all. And he gets a booby nuzzle, the lucky bastard. Oh, cool. I'll well, give you a booby nuzzle. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and there's a nice shot, admittedly, as the camera pans up looking down on Chad Zier in the pool. And the episode closes with her sitting down to play the annoying tune. whoop de doo Now, if this had been the episode straight after the search, parts one and two... Yes, I would have been very annoyed because it would, yeah, it's a completely different change of pace. Very dull. So I didn't find it dull. I found it interesting that we were exploring. Did you not find it dull because you didn't remember it? Because my problem was I remembered everything about it, so it was really just a. a I very... remembered why. I don't remember the host's name, but I remember Correct. there was an extra host. Uh-huh. I remembered that he was nasty. Yeah. I remembered that had been suppressed and she didn't remember. And I remembered that the symbiont guy knew kind of what was going on. I remembered she was going to go in a cave and go in... Oh, you remembered most of it, Dip in some goo. Yeah. I remembered... Yeah, all right, you remembered most of it then. Yeah. 
Yeah, see, I... I remember most of it, but I've always found the trill fascinating Mm -hmm. as a a race. And here we get to explore a bit more of their backstory. Even though trill is part of the Federation, they're not all sweetness and light. They've Mm -hmm. got a conspiracy at their heart. Yeah. And when she turns around and she says, but if people knew that... You know, 50% of our population could be joined the trill would just be bartered, so we're lying about it. And you just think, well, you could still have the initiate programme. You don't have to assume the worst of your populace. You know, so I like mm. that aspect of those who are in charge keeping secrets. It's actually quite sinister, which I like. I like that we're exploring more of Dax, who we don't know that much about. This is a good Terry Farrell performance. I'll, I'll certainly so grant you that. It's a good performance. She's, I she's like, being a bit more stretched yeah, in this one. I like Cisco, the hard negotiator. Hmm. Um, you never get the impression he's not going to get his way, though, to be fair. No, but I like when he turns around and says, I'm going to release his information unless you save my friend. Hmm. You know, and he doesn't back down. I like that. I like the, the pools. I like the strange guardians. They're eccentric. I like that Bashir and Dax now have a non lechy yes, re- nice relationship. Well, yeah. I like that aspect of it. I like that Bashir's response is, we need to go to Trill, I can't solve this. Um, I like that, although Dax initially is horrible, she does check herself into the infirmary to get checked out and you find out a bit more about the physiology. I like that effectively you've got mental health difficulties portrayed on screen in a a, a time period when supposedly everybody is fine, if you see what I mean. You know, in terms of the Federation, it's it's almost as though, in a way, you wouldn't expect it because humanity's lovely now or the Federation's lovely now and you've got somebody hallucinating and it's nobody tells her she's mad. People don't ignore her she is taken seriously and she is treated and the 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 root causes of her hallucinations are looked at and, mm. and nobody shuns her nobody tells tells her off or anything so i like that aspect of it for me it is slow paced but that in and of itself for me isn't a problem because you learn things pretty much when Dax herself does it's not one of those situations where it's slow paced and, you, and you're going oh come on you should know this by now because somebody's told you the viewer sooner than mm-hmm. the characters know it doesn't have that flaw so as somebody who finds the trill interesting you learn more but not too much like you get later on with the Klingons that you know too much about them and they stop being interesting yeah I mean we don't get too many uh, in Insights into the truly aspect. There's one other episode that springs to mind that I think is rather better than this one, as far as I remember. Oh, yes, I know the one you're talking about, and I do prefer it. Yeah. I'm not trying to say this is great. Mm. I'm just saying that. And I'm not saying this is appalling, I hasten to add. I just, I just find it kind of dull, but there and we are. For me, it's interesting. I'm not trying to claim it's action packed. Mm-hmm. I just, for me, it's interesting. Cool. Well, let's find out what everybody else thought. Doreen, what did she think of it? She says. My husband commented on the fact that Cisco, Bashir and Dax take the Defiant on a mission to somewhere they shouldn't be expecting trouble. Mm. And after quite commenting on the Dominion threat every two minutes... Yeah, quite. This move does seem very short-sighted. But I guess husband's other comment holds weight here too. Got the set, let's use it. Uh, I think I think your explanation's better. It's got more speed. Yeah, and speed is, time is of the essence. Mm-hmm. I mean, what I do think they they should have done rather than staying in orbit was then brought once they got there is then left them a shuttlecraft and took them yeah took them the the defiant back back. to the station that would make more sense yeah Yeah. dorian says dax walking into one of the symbiont reproductive pools near the end was icky (laughs) yes lovely milky milky further insight into trill culture was good i'm beginning to wonder if every time we get such an insight in ds9 it will expose corruption (laughs) Mm. Yeah, there's yeah, yeah, nothing, yeah, nothing yeah, is pure yeah. in, in Deep Space Nine. Yeah. Mind you, it's probably very true to life. How cynical. <laughs> well, mm-hmm. Did Dax just nick Jake's futuristic Casio organ? I don't know. Oh, well, you got the impression he didn't really care for it anymore, so possibly no. he gave it to her. Yeah. Yes. See, the other reason I like this is I rather like Terry Farrell, and you get to see a lot of her boobs. Yeah, you do. 
and you get to see the spots going all the way to her toes as well. You do, so. and you get you get a nice shot of her figure that sort of starts with her legs and then takes in her crotch, mm. and, and yeah. So, you know, th- there's lots to like for me. <laughs> yeah, but I appreciate that too, but uh, yes. Okay. The Mark has this to say about equilibrium. All the floor with gut slugs as a basis for a civilization. Excuse me, ladies and gents, I'm about to go off on a rant. Oh, here we go, deep breath. Whilst Act 1 is entertaining and effective, proving Farrell can play Dax with an attitude, when she dumps all the pieces of the chess set on the floor, you can spot a second fully set up chess set in the background on Cisco's desk. Really? Which is Dax is leaving. I presume it's a gaff, and that multiple boards were set up to reduce waiting times between takes. Oh, blimey. Oh, dear. But in universe, it looks like. Not only has Cisco asked Dax to play a game of 2D chess in his bizarrely in his office, but has set up multiple boards for the occasion. <laughs> Perhaps he was cheating. Oh, <laughs> maybe she was right. Kira tries to bring Dax to realise her recent abusive tone towards others. Dax turns on her. Hence, Judge the ears want some thinkable line, get your hands off me, if I do something I'll regret. Dax finally winds up in the infirmary where Bashir uses medical babble to explain that her behaviour is the result of an imbalance between host and symbiont. Fair events put Jadzia's life in danger as she's rushed into emergency surgery. The mystery leads to Trek's first visit to the Trill homeworld, where Dax is placed under special medical supervision by the Symbiosis Committee. One disappointing aspect here is a map painting featuring what is supposed to be an amazing and stunning beautiful world, but instead it comes across as far too restrained by focusing mainly on a single building. Trill is also shot s- solely on two unremarkable sets. Now, in terms of the map painting, that's what they do. Every yeah. time you visit a planet, yeah. you'll just see one or two buildings at tops. Yeah. Uh, so I'm kind of used to it. It's a stylistic thing. You don't get great, big, long panoramic views. And you no. can't really on a TV screen. If this was a movie, it would be different. It's rather like comparing what you see of Romulus in the TV series and what you see of it in Nemesis. Yeah, where, yeah but at least you get some good views, <laughs> you know, panning shots. Because widescreen lends itself to that. But anyway. The unremarkable sets, yeah, but I mean, it's Federation. So you're not surprised, really. This leads to the utter sci-fi cliché of the reveals to Dax that one of her previous hosts, a violent tempered musician who killed a doctor, was blocked from her memory. Jadzia allows the memories to be reintegrated into the Dax symbiont, adding to her own personality. Hopefully this will profoundly change her currently underwhelming personality. The doctor wouldn't hesitate to kill to protect their little secret. Makes one wonder how many others have needlessly died over the years. That's true, actually. She although, might not be the first. Mm, although I don't really see the harm in everyone knowing they still have an initiate process due to the number of trills yeah, available. That's what I said. Yep. Yep. Here's where it goes off the rails for the gut slugs. Trill host selection process looks worse and worse with each passing trill focused episode. In this episode, we learn that unsuitable hosts are supposed to reject the symbiont at the point of death, but that this is a lie by the Symbiosis Commission to prevent chaos, i.e., for them to maintain control by telling anyone they decide to blackball that they would die if they joined. This seems to contradict invasive procedures in which Jadzia says that an improper joining could cause permanent psychological damage to host and symbiont, and playing God, in which it seemed like the big risk was not that Arjun would die if he misjoined, but that he would be overwhelmed by symbiont. But again, this is all the lies they're being fed. Yeah. So Jadzia doesn't know any different, Arjun doesn't know any different. I do find it funny to imagine, though, that the Symbiosis Commission's weeding through candidates, presumably with a scientific methodology akin to a lottery, on top of that, the whole trio symbiocracy is unstable, placing joining as a kind of ultimate fulfilment goal to the point where their whole society seems to be built around it. This is yeah, true, that true. is stupid, yeah, yeah. yeah. While making excuses while most people aren't good enough in order to justify the vast majority of the population being left out. Here, the Symbiosis Commission is willing to kill Jadzi in order to cover up, not even the fact that they have a killer skeleton in their closet, but the fundamental idea that just because someone is successfully joined does not mean they are a psychologically stable or even non-murderous person, which to me seems once again about power and influence. Yeah. And the story ends with them still keeping their secret anyway, so any changes in the trill have to happen on the individual level. In the one trill we know well, Jadzia does dominate the first few acts, but soon is comatose question of what it actually means to have the memories of a cold-blooded psychotic murderer living inside oneself is largely ignored or generously left to future episodes. Well, that's true. Yeah. And whilst the pool stuff the symbiotes is interesting, but wow, Trill don't even let the Guardians go out and see the sun? Also, given that the electrical impulse are symbionts communicating with each other, how exactly is Jazeera Dax having some electrical zaps supposed to help relieve her trauma? 
Are the other symbionts who talked to Dax about the whole Duran thing between joinings present there to remind Dax about it or something? Yeah, it didn't, didn't make any sense I, to me either. What I presume it is is that they've put in some sort of neural block between the symbiont and the host to stop the host remembering Duran. And so what happens is when they get the, the electrical impulse between the symbionts, it's reinforcing the connection between the symbiont and the host, allowing the host to remember what Dax never forgot, what a host was never allowed to remember. Mm-hmm. The music she constantly hears was haunting. Well, that's one word for it. And I enjoyed how crazy it made her behave with her friends. Cisco and Bashir doing everything they can for Jadzia is good to see, particularly evidence of Bashir's being a good friend to her and whom she can trust without pressing to sleep with her or trying to take advantage of her vulnerability. Mm. Thankfully, he's no longer that much of a jerk. Yeah, that yeah. is a good thing about the yeah, episode. One other little nitpick about this episode, they took the warship over to Trill. <laughs> sure is a good thing the Dominion didn't decide to attack while the Defiant was being used for a trip that seemingly could have been handed by a runabout. And they sure fixed the Defiant rather quickly, didn't they? Overall, it's underwhelming. That's a lie. It's utter guts luck dribble. Well, I'm with you the first time. It was definitely underwhelming. I really like it. That's because you like trills. Yes. <laughs> We've established that now. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Let's hear from Sampo. And he writes, Hello, here's some feedback from Equilibrium. The episode starts with one of the strangest teasers yet. The beginning <laughs> with the crew having dinner is actually a very nice scene. And the image of Odo stirring the bowl is now forever burned into my brain. But yeah. the thing is that's supposed to keep us watching is Dax playing a tune on a Casio keyboard? Yeah. Not really thrilling stuff. After the credits, the beginning is promising enough. Dax acting completely out of character and also completely failing to acknowledge it is quite creepy. But things go downhill after that. The hallucinations with the masks are quite repetitive and boring and apologetic Dax is a lot less interesting than hostile Dax. Mm. We do get the best scene of the episode on The Defiant, the one with Bashir and Dax. When Bashir invites Dax to his quarters, a whole bunch of alarms start going off inside my head. But surprisingly, the whole scene is warm and not in the least bit awkward Mm. and Bashir is a complete gentleman. Shows how the character has evolved since the first season. And we finally see the planet Trill, and it consists of a matte painting of one building, one room, and a cave with a hippie having a milk bath. This planet does not got many, get many points for realisation or coolness. Yeah, well, yeah, again, it, it's not uncommon. I mean, just look at Kronos in the previous episode. We get to see two rooms and a matte painting of a building. Mm. You know, it, it's, 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 you've got to accept that's the limitations of the TV, both the TV budget and also the TV screen. Yeah. The rest of the episode is very run-of-the-mill medical mystery with very little real tension. The high point is the end with Cisco being a badass and basically saying he'll bring down the whole true system of government if Dax is not saved. And I completely believe he'd do it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the problem is that the Doctor's such a feeble character that you know immediately she's going to buckle. So yeah. there doesn't seem to be any sort of tension. It's like, well, Cisco's going to get his way then, isn't yeah. he? The idea of having a suppressed past life for a trill is a good one, but apart from a few good scenes, the episode didn't keep me interested. Too bad. Until next time, keep up the good work. See, it did keep me interested. Ah, I see Sampo seems to be more in accordance with me on that one. Okay. Legget Brian. This is another episode lacking the punch of some of the preceding episodes, despite that I found it an enjoyable, easy-to-watch story. It's nice to see a bit more background to the trill and their culture. There are a couple of points that did stand out for me, though. Firstly, do Starfleet health and safety breaks allow cooking over an open flame in your quarters? Mm. Yeah, the, the fire true. suppression systems yeah. have to be somehow circumnavigated, don't they? But uh, that happens in other stories as well, doesn't it? Now, I get that Dax is very poorly and her friends are worried and want to get her treated quickly, but sure, there are other alternatives to taking the cornerstone of the Federation's defences against the Dominion on a personal trip. Can you imagine the report if they had returned to Deep Space Nine to find Deep Space Nine overrun by Gemma Dar and had to explain why the Defiant was busy elsewhere. Are the trolls so naive as to make the most basic error of just deleting someone's record and leaving it empty? Yeah. That is stupid, yeah. It wouldn't be too hard to make up some trite to replace the information they deleted. True, the protagonists would still find some barely plausible reason to see through the ruse, but it wouldn't make a developed culture look like toddlers trying to tell a lie. In case it sounds like I'm being unduly harsh, I shall point out some things I liked about the episode. Kira and Civis. Quite, I didn't clock that, blimey. She, she wears a sort of green crochet thing. Oh, okay. 
The completely unnecessary and inexplicable but not unwelcome close-up of Dax's chest while her abdomen is being scanned. Yeah. I also felt the music was rather well done, with the same theme that Dax plays on the keyboard being carried through in the atmospheric pieces. All in all, a fun episode, it just needed more Cardassians. Until next time, Leggett Brian. Well, yes, I think you're quite right there. <laughs> mm. Let's find out if Drew and Tracy were excited by this one. This is our feedback for Equilibrium. Is that what it's called? It was I called didn't even that, yeah. that one. I know, you didn't. You wasn't concentrating on it, is that? Uh, That's why I yeah. liked it. Yeah. I don't know. This was a... Uh, a weird episode. It kind of started out. It really kind of caught my attention because I thought, "Oh, this it, is going to be quite it was a good." It's a bit like Twilight Zone, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I yeah. thought, "Oh, you know, Dax is PMSing hard style in this <laughs> episode," and it was a little bit maybe enough. And then it just seemed to go a bit silly. And I don't know. I just I really couldn't keep my attention. In this yes, episode. I noticed that with you. Yeah, I I didn't want to like at the end of this to go. Oh, it's a bit of a boring episode because it's not got space battles or whatever. No, it's okay. It's just a bit more of a kind of lower gear episode. yeah i mean it was one of those ones where you know it shows that um cisco is like you know very like protective you know, yeah of his of his crew but then you know how many other of his staff... oh, especially dax i think because he, he knew dax from when yeah but when how many other of his staff end up in sick bay and he's standing over them waiting for them to yes kind of come no, to I think he's I got a think... special relationship yeah definitely. but i just think well it's a bit of favoritism going on there I also thought, watching this, how Bashir has completely transformed now from, like, the idiot he was at the beginning until, like, a <laughs> lovely person. He yeah. really is just completely pleasant yeah. and caring and wanting to do the best thing. He's he's a lovely person now. There was a couple of times when I thought, actually, is he going to get it on with Jadzia in here? Especially yeah. when she went to stay in his bunk. I thought there might have been a bit no, of a side where she though, was being it? a bit... You know, flirty, yeah, flirty, flirty. and I thought she might kind of make a play for him, but I think also at the same time, I think he would have told her where to go because they're mates, aren't they? See, you was a little bit like at the end of it, you wasn't 100% what it was going no, I was on. I was a bit like, did you get that? I think what it was was that it turned out she had a different host for six months that they had um, that they'd covered up because they didn't want everyone to know that. Pretty much anyone can be a host. Like they, they like to make everyone think that only a tiny percentage can yeah. do it. But they put it into a wrong person or didn't reject it. So what they did is, when, when they finally did reject it after six months, they then tried to erase it. So they erased all the information from the computer and erased her memory. But it was slowly coming back. That's why she was starting to learn... To, that she could play the piano But why again. would you reject it after six months? Be- Do hosts not reject almost instantly? No, that, that's what they're trying to make everyone think. But they he rejected it after six months because he was an unstable person. So it was not... Who was unstable? The host or the yeah, symbiote? The, the, the host, the, the right. musician guy, was it? J- Duran. 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 Duran, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's, that's what it was uh, okay. about, really. It was all right. Yeah. Oh, I did, oh, just before you say that, um, they've obviously not got Shazam in the future, have they, in Star Trek? What's Shazam? Yeah, you, you know, where you can just play, like, like I've got my phone. You oh, need, yeah. You yeah. push the button and <laughs> a little bit of music and it instantly comes up with it. I oh, mean, yeah. they, like, put it in the computer and it's, like, about, like, two, three days later it yeah. come up with the song. <laughs> yeah, obviously our technology now is a little bit more advanced than what they've got on the Defiant, eh? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's, it's okay episode, I felt. I, right. Yes, it was lower key, slower paced, but, you know, you're going to get them episodes. I didn't mind it, it was all right. Yeah, it was bit, Character building, I guess. It's all right, it's a bit boring. Fair enough. You liked it when uh, Dax was going, going went to the milk pool. I thought when she thought taken she was taken her robe You went da 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 And then and she had, had another like, robe on underneath. And my comment was, yeah. oh, I like her dress. Probably not like the reaction we should have been having, but, mm. you know, that kind of summed up the episode there. Yeah, that was the best bit. Yeah. Anyway, shall we leave it there? Okay. Lovely. Let's have the next one. Yep. Thank you. Bye. 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 It's the wrong host, Gromit. Uh-huh. <laughs> and they've got no Shazam. Have you heard of Shazam? I've never heard of Shazam in, in terms of it's presumably some sort of app. I've heard of Shazam the superhero, but that's something else. <laughs> yes. And, and Dax, it's not a euphemism. No, apparently not. Dax PMing it hard style. That, that's PMSing not right. it hard style. PMSing? Oh, I'm, oh, I don't even want to go there. <laughs> I like it, but most other people don't. <laughs> Apparently so, to varying degrees. Let's find out what Purry made of it, then see if he loved it like you. 
Hello again, you'll all be glad to know I don't have any musical numbers for Equilibrium, um, so that will have to go on without some iffy singing. Um, but uh, So we go on to our Dax episode, and I did complain in Season 1, and to an extent in Season 2, that we didn't really get much of Dax, and so I'm kind of torn on this one, because... On one hand, I actually quite like the shadiness of the Trill Commission and the general uh, massive fleshing out of the Trill as a species and how they exist, um, how the sort of symbiotes are, you know, the fact that the symbiotes can survive outside the host in a kind of a, a gooey, horrible pool, um, and that there are people who kind of talk to them. Um, I quite like that. There is a sort of a quasi-mysticism involved in the whole thing, which you can imagine would arise from that sort of thing. Um, obviously, in the enlightened federation they aren't worshipped as gods or anything but uh, you could see where that can, can come from and the fact that you know people are tried so you know, are sort of uh, trialed to be joined trills and it's probably a great honour and you are kind of a, a maybe not a first class citizen but you know it's something special and everyone appreciates it um, I did quite like the way crazy trill bloke actually recognised Axe um, of course, he could have just looked up her picture, uh, so it might not actually be that spooky, but he does at least um, play his part well enough to, you know, as in, not the actor, just as in the character plays his part well enough to look mysterious. The main downside of this, I find, aside from we get some cooking as well, and we get um, Odo stirring gumbo, was it? I can't remember. Odo stirring something, and that, that was quite nice, and I think, you know, we do like seeing cooking. Cisco has a hobby, and he does actually do some real cooking. I presume he had to disable the fire suppression system, but still, it is nice this idea that replicators are good, but real cooking is better. Um, I do like that idea, and it does maybe explain occasions where we have seen cooking and restaurants and things in Star Trek before. In fact, it possibly explains the entire purpose of Quarks, but uh, maybe not. Um, so, and notably in this episode, there isn't really a B plot. The whole plot is this um, story with Dax, and. Like I say, my main issue is because I really like the fleshing out, I like the kind of universe building, and I like the shady conspiracy of actually more people could have symbiotes, but they have to give this impression that it's a very small number because otherwise they just become commodities, they'd be traded, and it wouldn't be good for anyone. And I kind of like that, almost the big lie. And indeed, again, a bit of the non trekkiness of it, you once again get Cisco basically saying, well, okay, I'll not tell your secret, but you best sort out my crew member, and I'll let you carry on being a liar. Which, again, is something that you'd maybe not get in TNG, where um, someone might go and know people have a right to know, they might go a bit more ethical. Cisco is just, fine, do your thing, but make sure my people are okay. And it is a bit of a character change to him. He He's either a bigger picture person who sees the way the Trill Society needs to function, or he just doesn't give a stuff, and he's making sure that his friend survives. And um, either I actually quite like, just because it does make him a different character. He's not your typical Starfleet commander at this point. Um, and what we also see, like I say, the downside of the episode, it's just a bit dull. Um, I mean, I was watching it on a train, which doesn't help, but I did find myself kind of, my attention was drifting, you know. You're suddenly feeling the presence of your phone in your pocket and thinking, you know, I could... I could have a signal now. I don't know which part of the middle of nowhere I'm rocketing through, but uh, I might have a signal, and I could kind of, uh, you know, look at some tweets while this is on, just just you know, just to take my attention while it's doing some slow talky bits. And I think that's the issue, is that uh, while it's interesting what they do, they don't necessarily present it in that interesting a way, and as a result, the episode fell a bit flat for me. So that's a sad thing you know, uh, to, for the series you know, it's uh, considering they had so much interesting material to work with they didn't quite hold my attention or it could have been the slightly iffy uh, Virgin Trains um, burger that I just had was distracting me so who knows, we could blame this all on Richard Branson and his iffy microwavable burgers um, but uh, all I have left to say is do keep up the good work it's a very good podcast and I look forward to the next one, until then, bye for now Ah, that's what was floating in that milky pool Virgin train burgers. <laughs> I do think Picard wouldn't have gone with keeping the line circulation. He would have decided no. actually that that was against his principles. So I, yeah, you're right. I like the fact Cisco is different. So yes. that, that's a good thing. Yes. Yeah. And I, 
Real cooking is better, yeah, unless it's Riker cooking an omelette, then it isn't. <laughs> Beating his eggs. Oh, don't. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, the, the food in Quarks is replicated, though, because uh, you remember he, he has those replicators that were out of action at one yeah. point. But on the other hand, are you you kind of got the impression the, the food in the uh, Klingon chef's restaurant was freshly yeah. made gach yeah. rather than replicated rubbish. So, yeah, I think there is something about, still something about having freshly cooked food that would be appealing and slightly slightly better than, than what you can get in replicators, depending on how well you can program the replicator, of course, I guess. A bit like maybe Chinese takeaway compared with pot noodle. <laughs> Possibly, although hopefully not quite so extreme, otherwise nobody's going to eat replicated food. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, don't you think, though, that early replicators are pot noodle? Like, that maybe Possibly. they got better over time, One but that's hope. what they started yeah. with. <laughs> Cool. Well, thanks for all the feedback, folks. Thank you. Yeah, I think most people are kind of on my side in that one. Yeah, right? I was never going to Thunderdome it, but I just you. really like it. I'm just on my low. Oh, well, in a very small minority, certainly. Yeah. What do we have next for Broadcast 8.3, recording on Thursday the 31st of March, right at the end of the month? That's really hard to say. It is, yes. <laughs> I, I managed it as well. After well done. Four beers. We have what I remember being a really good Legate Bride will be happy Cardassian story Ooh. Second Skin oh yes that's awesome Kira wakes up looking rather different no, I, I remember that one say no more and we have the Abandoned which is kind of I Borg but for the Jemadar oh yeah I remember that one or not and I can't remember if that's any good or not well is it just, I remember really enjoying it first time round but I'm not sure I've rewatched it since first time round, if that makes sense. So mm-hmm. I, I don't. It'll be interesting to see if it has rewatch value. First time round, put it this way: we were le- we learnt a lot as viewers, mm. so it had that interest value. Yeah. But I don't know what it's going to be like on a rewatch. We shall find out next time on Broadcast Eight Point Three. See you then. Cheerio, bye. Bye, bye. Podcast is brought to you by the lovely people at geekplanetonline.com. All music referenced is for illustrative purposes only and no copyright infringement is intended. The music at the beginning of this podcast was produced by the 86th Floor on YouTube and is used with their kind permission. To contact us, you can use the forums at geekplanetonline.com. Visit our Tumblr site at broadcast.tumblr.com where you'll find images accompanying the episodes discussed in this cast. Send email messages or mp3s to broadcast at geekplanetonline.com Or you can contact us via Twitter on rev underscore org or broadcast ammo. Hashtag broadcast. Shut it down!